Hello, welcome to the first Henry Louis Gates Jr. Lecture. I'm very, very happy to see all of you here today. My name is Elizabeth Alexander and I'm the chair of the African American Studies Department here at Yale. Before we go any further, um, I want us to pause for a moment and remember our very, very dear friend and colleague, Maria Rosa Menocal, who passed away yesterday after a long illness. For many years as the director of this space, the Whitney Humanities Center, she filled it with intellectual and cultural energy and excellence, not to mention her own extraordinary sense of style and spirit and her true and evident love for life. That's what she gave to this place year after year. So we miss her very much um, and this will always be her space, so uh, let's just take a moment to remember her. Okay, today's event, uh, which we're very excited about, is happening because of the generosity of Daniel and Joanna Rose. Mr. Rose wanted to do something at Yale for his dear friend, Skip Gates, and I'm extremely honored that his gift will rest in the Department of African American Studies. His gift will allow us to host a major lecture each year of the scale of this one, with cutting edge thinkers in the far-flung and fascinating terrain of the broadest definition of African American studies. Each year a guest will come and spend the day with us first in the department as we did today with Professors Appiah and Gates, talking with our graduate students and our faculty, and then with the entire Yale and New Haven communities invited to hear new work. These lectures will be collected in book form and I envision these volumes to be must reads for people to see what's happening on the cutting edge of our field. With lectureships of this stature, we further solidify and expand the work that we're doing here in the classroom in conversation with each other and with the scholarship that we're putting out into the world. This is work that is resonant with the Rose's concerns and commitments over many, many, many years. Mr. Rose writes and speaks extensively on issues and challenges facing black communities. And among many, many other extraordinary legacies, he has built the Harlem Education Activities Fund, which has supported hundreds and hundreds of young people through successful high school, college, and postgraduate careers. Very quietly, he buys thousands of volumes of books and gives them away to students in public schools, especially in New York City. And now he is enabling us to do this here at Yale. Skip Gates did so much to build African American studies at Yale when he was an assistant professor along with our inaugural lecturer. And the friendship between Professors Gates and Appiah began in the classroom and developed as they taught together at Yale in another beautiful era of African American studies with Charles Davis and John Blassingame as chairs and architects. We here have continued to grow and build and so obviously has Skip, obviously. Uh, and the special significance, Mr. Rose, of this lecture is that your generosity has enabled us to be able to honor Skip where he was an undergraduate, where his mind was shaped and caught fire from his brilliant classmates and from his teachers. We had the privilege of hearing about that at lunch today. So thank you, Mr. Rose, for enabling us to honor our beloved Skip Yates, and thank you for the spotlight you helped to shine on African American studies at Yale emanating around the world. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, just a word on the many who have worked so hard on this event. Um, it's had many hands and many elves in the workshop, uh, especially Lisa Monroe and Philip Green in the Department of African American Studies, Regina Starolis and Nina Glickson in the President's Office, the great Diane Witte and Hillary Brown in the development office. Uh, this has been a major undertaking for us, but now we have a template for doing it in the future. And our plans for this lecture are to hold it in celebration every early fall, uh, and as I said, to bring the work together in book form. And so now I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, Anthony Appiah. After his lecture, I'll return to the stage and say a few words about Henry Louis Gates before he then uh, closes our afternoon. And you'll then uh, join us at a reception right down the hallway. <laughs> 
In his book, In My Father's House, Anthony Appiah wrote, quote, if my sisters and I were children of two worlds, no one bothered to tell us this. We lived in one world in two extended families divided by several thousand miles and an allegedly insuperable cultural difference that never, so far as I can recall, puzzled or perplexed us much. As I grew older and went to English boarding school, I learned that not everybody had family in Africa and in Europe. Not everyone had a Lebanese uncle, American and French and Kenya and Thai cousins. And by now, now that my sisters have married a Norwegian and a Nigerian and a Ghanaian, now that I live in America, I am used to seeing the world as a network of points of affinity. It is this worldview, born at home, grown at home, that Anthony Appiah has brought with such rigor and elegance to his work over the years. His Cambridge dissertation explored the foundations of probabilistic semantics, once revised. These arguments were published by Cambridge University Press as assertions and conditionals. And out of that monograph grew a second book, For Truth in Semantics. He has taught at Yale, as we've discussed, Cornell, Duke, Harvard universities, has lectured at many other institutions in the United States, Germany, Ghana, South Africa, uh, and France, and is now a faculty member at Princeton University, where he has appointments in the philosophy department and the University Center for Human Values, as well as the Center for African American Studies, the program in African Studies, and the program in Translation Studies, and the Department of Comparative Literature uh, and Politics. During his time at Yale, he was one of the architects of the African American Studies curriculum, especially at the graduate level, building the vision that we are carrying forth today. He has published widely in African American and African literary and cultural studies. In 1992, Oxford published the book I quoted from, In My Father's House, which explores, among other things, the role of African and African American intellectuals in shaping contemporary African cultural life. In 1996, he published Color Conscious, The Political Morality of Race with University of Pennsylvania President Amy Gutman. In 1997, The Dictionary of Global Culture, co-edited with Henry Louis Gates, Jr., and edited the Encarta Africana CD-ROM Encyclopedia, published by Microsoft, which uh, is uh, an encyclopedia of nothing no less than the history of black people all over the globe. There are too many publications to name. I want to call note to Bu Mebe, Proverbs of the Akan, which he co-authored with his mother, the writer Peggy Appiah, uh, the annotated edition of 7,500 Proverbs in Twi uh, uh, that we find in that book. He's the author of three novels as well, and uh, continuing in the philosophical work, The Ethics of Identity and Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers. He has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and again, this is selected, uh, the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Until 2009, he served as a trustee of Ashesi University College in Accra, and now is on its academic advisory board. He has received honorary degrees from many universities, including Colgate University, Bard College, Fairleigh Dickinson, Swarthmore College, and uh, after Colby College honored him with a doctorate of laws in their 189th commencement, the next one came when he was granted an honorary doctorate of humane letters at a convocation lecture at Berea College, and then the honorary degree of doctor of laws at Harvard's 361st commencement. He has been called, and I love this, our postmodern Socrates. I didn't make that up, but I, I, uh, I will deploy it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, and I would characterize his work as posing questions and leading us to conclusions which are not aimed to comfort our most cherished forms of selfhood, but rather to disturb them. He scrutinizes race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, class, religion, nationhood, with an eye for the generative power of understanding their ethical ambivalences. He does not aim to deny the legitimacy of these large collective identities, but rather considers how obsessive loyalties can threaten freedom and community. His thinking forwards Du Bois's concept of double consciousness at the turn of this century. Professor Appiah, we welcome you home to Yale African American Studies for the first Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Please welcome the Lawrence S. Rockefeller University Professor of Philosophy, Anthony Appiah. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction.
And uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Skip. And thank you, Yale, which was the uh, institution that brought me to the United States. This was, uh, I first came to the United States as a visiting graduate student here under the uh, care of uh, Charles Davis uh, in the African American Studies and Ruth Marcus in philosophy, uh, whom we've also recently lost. But um, so I owe a very great deal to this institution. Um, as I recall, there were just two undergraduates of African descent at Clare College, Cambridge, in England in 1972. I was a medical student, and the other one was a philosopher, a Nigerian. But we were joined the next year by a recent Yale graduate, the first African-American Mellon Fellow at the college, who, ha who arrived, as it happens, with the first woman to receive that honor. His name, as I'm sure you will anticipate, was Henry Louis Gates, Jr. We became, as you will also anticipate, the best of friends. He told me later that in the first weeks that he was in college, people kept asking him if he'd met Anthony Appiah, and being a smart fellow, he came pretty quickly, quickly to the conclusion that I, too, must be, as no one at Clare would ever have said out loud, a black person. <laughs> So I have known the scholar we are celebrating today for nearly 40 years. Skip studied at Cambridge with the great Nigerian critic, poet, novelist, and dramatist, Wallace Inka, who was a visitor to the university in those days. It was through Skip that I met Wale, and the three of us dined together from time to time over hearty food and steadily improving wine. In those dinner conversations, and in hundreds of others with Skip, I was persuaded for the first time that the questions that interested him about race and culture and identity were not just existential questions, but academic questions as well. Uh, so uh, I owe that to him. And it was indeed he who persuaded me to come to Yale and to America for the first time in 1978. It was largely because of him that I had a great time here as a visiting graduate student. And it was he who convinced me when I was finishing my PhD a couple of years later that I ought to consider a job here. He probably was the person who persuaded Yale that they ought to consider me. Now, I knew about Pan-Africanism, of course, before I met Skip. For one thing, my father knew W.B. Du Bois and saw the great man at the 1945 Pan-African Conference in Manchester, which my father attended as a member of WASU, the West African Students' Union, which he went on to lead as, as its president. But Pan-Africanism was something we lived in our family. George Padmore substituted for Kwame Nkrumah as best man at my parents' wedding. Richard Wright, that's my parents' wedding. Padmore is invisible on the, behind my father's left, uh, right shoulder. Uh, uh, Richard, Richard Wright and C.L.R. James both visited our home in Ghana when I was a child. James Baldwin and Maya Angelou were in our library. So a pan-African identity was, as I say, something existential rather than something theoretical. But I think it was Skip who turned this family project of mine into a scholarly interest. Soon, I found myself teaching my first class at Yale, a college seminar in the spring of 1979 on Pan-Africanism, spending time buried deep in the Sterling Library stacks, trying to keep ahead of the students. I can still recall the excitement of finding in the open stacks a box of pamphlets of Independence Day speeches in Liberia from the mid-19th century, including one by Alexander Crummel, an African-American who graduated from Cambridge rather earlier than Skip and I did in 1853. <laughs> I hope I've told you enough to explain how honored and delighted I am to be giving the first Henry Louis Gates Jr. lecture here at Yale. And I hope you'll forgive me for selecting as the subject of that first lecture not one of your alumni, but the first African-American to get the PhD at Harvard conceding to you that the first African-American to get the PhD was a Yale man who got it a good deal earlier <laughs> uh, in physics. Uh, my subject is identity and W.B. Du Bois's contributions to our understanding of it. I want to begin by trying to disentangle one of Du Bois's most <coughs> distinctive paradoxes, the combination of a respect for individuality with a deep concern for various groups to which he belonged, and the related conjunction of his global and local identifications. 
We'll handle these difficulties best, I'm going to argue, by recognizing Du Bois's immersion in the German philosophical traditions of the late 19th century. What a historian once called Du Bois's love affair with Imperial Germany persisted even after the country had traveled the route from the nationalism of the 19th century to national socialism. Du Bois was not blind to German anti-Semitism, either in the early 1890s in his graduate years in Berlin or in the much more virulent forms it took in the 1930s. When he visited Nazi Germany in 1936, he wrote that the campaign, I'm quoting, the campaign of race prejudice surpasses in vindictive cruelty and public insult anything I've ever seen, and I have seen much. And he went on to say, there's been no tragedy in modern times equal in its awful effects to the fight on the Jew in Germany. It is an attack on civilization comparable only to such horrors as the Spanish Inquisition and the African slave trade. You should recall that these words were written before the campaign of mass murder began. But Germany was the first country in which Du Bois himself experienced life without the daily cruelties and public insults of racism. I had a strong affection for Germany, he once said, because in the days of my Sturm und Drang, it's characteristic Du Boisian formulation, this was the land where I first met white folk who treated me as a human being. This is a mild exaggeration, perhaps, but still, that's what he felt. Clearly, a sense of personal liberation was one of his major debts to his German experience. The second debt was intellectual. Du Bois developed, as a graduate student in Germany, a lasting framework for thinking about the relation between race and nation, culture and politics. Russell Berman has written insightfully about the German strain and Du Bois' thinking about race, nation and culture, something that was there in embryo before his arrival in Germany. His commencement address at Fisk in 1888 took Bismarck as a model of a nation-building hero. In employing the German chancellor to stand for an idea, Du Bois displays, as Berman sees, an incipient Hegelianism. This tendency would have been encouraged at Harvard, where prominent neo-Hegelians were not in short supply. But his intellectual debt to Germany was deepened by his schooling in Berlin, where he studied with uh, Adolf Wagner, Gustav uh, Schmoller, and William Wiltai, and heard lectures by Heinrich von Treitschke. It was training in Schmoller's graduate seminar that prepared him for the work of the Philadelphia Negro. And Robert Gooding Williams has shown how Du Bois's basic philosophical picture owes much to a broadly Hegelian nationalism, and more particularly to Schmoller's social philosophy. One way to enter that milieu is to go back to uh, Johann Gottfried Herder, the great German philosopher of Romanticism, who was preoccupied, like Du Bois, with the question of originality. Herder thought of originality, as Charles Taylor has pointed out, among others, at two levels, both at the level of the individual, distinct from the other individuals, from all other individuals, and at the level of the people, distinct from other peoples. And Du Bois, who grew on that Herderian tradition, there is an awful lot of Herder to draw on, <laughs> had no difficulty in stressing the importance of the development of race groups, as well as personal individuality. To speak in the language that we inherit from Romanticism, your being a German can shape the authentic self whose expression is the project of your life. Individuality is inflected by collectivities on this romantic picture. For Herder, every nation has a governing spirit, it's Volksgeist, a word one might translate as folk soul or folk spirit, which is expressed in every aspect of its social and cultural uh, being. So the character of each people can be found not only in the writing of its literary geniuses in Goethe and Helderlin, but also in its folklore. The folk songs and the folk tales collected, for example, under Herder's inspiration by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, which we know as Grimm's fairy tales. But the point for the, for the Grimm brothers was that they were collecting, as it were, data about the, the Volksgeist, about the German Volksgeist. Um, uh, they were mistaken in their belief that that was doing because many of these folk tales turn out to have originated, for example, in France and in Persia, but that's another topic. Um, uh, so, um, sorry. Herder would have understood why Du Bois prefaced each chapter of The Souls of Black Folk with both a literary epigraph 
and a phrase of a Negro spiritual. This is a copy of a page of the manuscript of the Souls of Black Folk. Negro spirituals were the folk song of his people. Du Bois's indication of his intellectual legacy, the theory of the Volksgeist, is hard to avoid. It is almost there in the title of his most famous work. He is showing his readers the geister, this is the plural of geist, of a black folk. For Herder, as for Du Bois, each Volksgeist possesses something of distinctive value. Nevertheless, Herder also insisted that uh, das Menschengeschlecht Geschlecht ist ein Ganzes. Wir arbeiten und dulden, sehen und erten füreinander. Humankind is a single thing, a whole. We work and suffer, sow and reap for each other. Indeed, part of the providential point of human history is that each people, each folk, should express its distinctive character through its particular history, because it is only through, because it is only through each nation's following its distinctive path that history as a whole can achieve its meaning. There is a word for the character of the nationalism that Du Bois expressed. It is cosmopolitan. In The Conservation of Races, an essay I'll return to in a moment, he writes that the Negro race and all the others are, quote, striving each in its own way uh, to uh, develop for civilization its particular message. Um, sorry, I was a premature. Uh, even here, he speaks not just of racial, but of human brotherhood. Du Bois is cosmopolitan as well in his openness to the achievements of other civilizations. His celebration of European culture is always evident. In the souls of black folk, we can see this in the coming of John, when, quote, the black John is moved beyond measure by Wagner's music. Sorry, when the black John is moved beyond measure by Wagner's music, quote, he sat in dreamland and started when, after a hush, rose high and clear the music of Lerngrin's swan. The infinite beauty of the whale lingered and slept and swept through every muscle of his frame and put it all atune. The Hedarian strain in Du Bois's cultural cosmopolitanism is evident too in his citations not just of German high culture, but of folk culture as well, as when he quotes a German folk song in the final pages of the souls. Jetzt geh an Sprünele trink aber nit. You might translate this as now I was going to the well, but ain't going to drink. <laughs> and uh, I may be able to get this to work. Let's see. Can I get this to work? I'm not sure I can actually play that little clip that's sitting down there, but it's, uh, it's very charming. Uh, <laughs> du Bois's cosmopolitanism is not just aesthetic. He accepts the cosmopolitan moral idea that he has obligations to those outside his racial horizon. And finally, he is cosmopolitan in his methods, insisting on a globally comparative perspective, even when he's talking about the United States. Du Bois sees the problem of G Jim Crow, for example, as part of a larger tragedy. The color line imposes Jim Crow in Georgia, but it also imposes a destructive colonialism, and what he regularly called, in one of his many poetical formulations, Asia and Africa and the islands of the sea. So Du Bois was an aesthetic, a moral, and a methodological cosmopolitan. How much more of a commitment to a sense of global citizenship can we ask for? He not only went, uh, went to the well of cosmopolitanism, he drank deeply from it, unlike the person who went to the Brunelle. Uh, for all that, uh, contemporary readers will be inclined to think of cosmopolitan nationalism as an oxymoron. Surely, cosmopolitanism, the idea that all human beings are, in some sense, fellow citizens of the world, is the very opposite of nationalism, the conviction that the boundaries of nationality should be the boundaries of citizenship. This is not an argument that would have ensnared someone with Du Bois's intellectual background. Friedrich Meinecke, who was only a little older than Du Bois and who, like him, had studied with Treitschke, wrote just five years after The Souls was published, cosmopolitanism and nationalism stood side by side in a close living relationship for a long time. The title of the book in which he wrote these words was Weltbürgertum und Nationalstaat, Cosmopolitanism and the Nation State, and the National State. The 19th century theorists of European nationalism recognized that the demand for national rights only made sense as a moral demand if it was claimed equally for all nations. The structure of the argument is one that Kant made familiar. My dignity cannot matter because it is mine. It has to matter because it is dignity. And if dignity is what matters, your dignity matters too. 
so mutatis mutandis for nationality. Uh, my nation, nation cannot matter because it's mine, it must matter because it's a nation, and if nation, nationality is what matters, then your nationality matters too. For Du Bois, the destiny of the Negro was to be understood as a strand in a larger human destiny. His nationalism never descended into chauvinism. When he is critical of white people, it's typically for a failure to honor the very universality of the values they espouse. In making these arguments in the American context, Du Bois is not, of course, by any means unique. The search for a proper balance between the local and the universal can be found as well in the contemporaneous writings of others of Du Bois's, another of Du Bois' teachers, uh, Josiah Royce, who was, like Du Bois, a careful student of German Romanticism. In June 1902, five years after Du Bois had published the earlier version of the first essay of The Souls in the Atlantic Monthly, Royce defended what he called, famously, provincialism in an essay to the Phi Beta Kappa Society at the University of Iowa. Resist the temptation to comment on talking about provincialism in Iowa. Um, by provincialism, he said, he meant, first, the tendency of a province to possess its own customs and ideals, Secondly, the totality of these customs and ideals themselves. And thirdly, the love and pride which leads the inhabitants of a province to cherish as their own these traditions, beliefs, and aspirations. Royce's defense of this provincialism as, quote, a saving power to which the world in the near future will need more and more to appeal might startle a contemporary reader used to the idea that provincial is a criticism, not a compliment. But Royce also recognized the dangers of what he called false forms of provincialism. Like the German patriotism he was borrowing from, his nationalism and his cosmopolitanism, like Du Bois's, stood side by side in a close living relationship. Du Bois, too, always recognized the risk that black folk would, facing hostility from their white brethren, withdraw from the vivifying contact with other nations and peoples. He makes the point in Dusk of Dawn when he talks of the way American racism imprisons uh, black people within the race. Practically, this group imprisonment within a group has various effects upon the prisoner. He tends to neglect the wider aspects of national life and human existence. On the one hand, he's unselfish so far as his inner group is concerned. He thinks of himself not as an individual, but as a group man, a race man. His loyalty to his group idea, this group idea, tends to be almost unending and balks at almost no sacrifice. On the other hand, his attitude towards the environing race congeals into a matter of unreasoning resentment and even hatred, deep disbelief in them, and refusal to conceive honesty and rational thought on their part. This attitude adds to the difficulties of conversation, intercourse, understanding between groups. Notice that everything Du Bois says here about black people enclosed within an American context can be applied equally to white Americans who have closed themselves off from the world. The formulation seems deliberately abstract. It unfurls a general critique of anti-cosmopolitan forms of nationalism. And indeed, in the 1920 essay, The Souls of White Folk, Du Bois expressed pity for white Americans, quote, imprisoned and enthralled, hampered and made miserable, by racism in very much the same terms. And what had such prisoners closed themselves off from? Well, Du Bois's most memorable formulation of his ideal can be found decades earlier in The Souls of Black Folk. There he spoke with a cosmopolitan instinct for conversation across peoples in these justly famous words. Across the color line I move in arm, arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, where smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. From out the caves of evening that swing between the strong-limbed earth and the tracery of the stars, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius and what soul I will, and they come all graciously with no scorn or, nor condescension. So, wed with truth, I dwell above the veil. Du Bois was, in the course of a long life, a citizen, as we all are, of more than one polis of Massachusetts and Georgia and New York, of the United States, of Ghana, and of course, less literally, of the Academy. But he was also always a citizen of the world. This was no stretch for someone who grasped with the German intellectuals whose insights were largely lost over the course of the last century, that cosmopolitanism and nationalism 
should be allies rather than adversaries. As I said just now, invoking a style of argument that goes back at least to Kant, my nationality cannot matter because it is mine. It has to matter because it is nationality. And Du Bois's cosmopolitanism was indeed infused with the second of the themes that I'm going to talk about today, the issue of the black racial identity. As we see again and again, Du Bois, like most great intellectuals, was not just a creative producer, but also a voracious consumer of ideas. And in developing and refining his understanding of black identity, what it means to be a Negro, as he would have put it, he drew on other scholarly developments, changes in the social and biological sciences that challenged the racial thinking of the 19th century in which he was reared. We can see something of the character of his thought about black identity in The Conservation of Races, published in 1897. The question we must seriously consider, he argues, is this. What is the real meaning of race? And he answers first that the, real, the final word of science so far is that we have at least two, perhaps three, great families of human beings, the whites and Negroes, possibly the yellow race. What matters about these races that science has discerned, however, is not, quote, the grosser physical differences of color, hair, and bone, but the, quote, differences, subtle, delicate, and elusive, though they may be, which have silently but definitely separated men into groups. What these subtle forces, while these subtle forces have generally followed the natural cleavage of common blood, descent, and physical peculiarities, they have at other times swept across and ignored these. At all times, however, they have divided human beings into races, which, while they perhaps transcend scientific definition, nevertheless are clearly defined to the eye of the historian and sociologist. So what Du Bois is insisting on here is an account of racial or national membership that is focused on the ideas expressed in the collective life of a people. And in insisting on this, he is thinking about national history in the way that it would have been taught, both at Harvard and the University of Berlin. It was, after all, the standard understanding of Hegel's philosophy of history that human experience was the working out of an idea, in fact, of something called the idea, in history. In the less metaphysical version of the story that Du Bois borrows not so much from philosophers but from historians, nations are the natural historical expressions, not of the grand universal idea, but of less grand particular ideas. The English nation, Du Bois says, stands for constitutional liberty and commercial freedom. The German for science and philosophy. The Romance nations for, yes, you guessed it, literature and art. If these are the capital I ideas of these people, Du Bois is searching for the Negro capital I idea. The full, complete message of the Negro race has not yet been given to the world. The question is then, how shall this message be delivered? How shall these various ideals be realized? The answer is plain by the development of these race groups, not as individuals, but as races. Only Negroes, inspired by one vast ideal, can work out its fullness, in its fullness the great message we, we Negroes, have for humanity. Now, we're inclined nowadays to suppose that what bound Negroes to each other from Du Bois must have been a biological theory of race. What else would a Victorian thinker believe he had? Why else would a Victorian thinker believe he had anything in common with people raised in an entirely different culture and climate on a continent thousands of miles away? But we can tell from Du Bois's easy movement between talk of race and talk of nation that his conception was not what we would call biological. But for those who are keeping track, that's a um, retraction of something I said in the most famous paper I've ever written about W.B. Du Bois. Um, <laughs> what mattered, he thought, what, what mattered, he thought, were not physical differences, but, quote, the deeper differences which are spiritual, psychical differences. That's why we can properly speak of his attitude to his racial identity as a form of nationalism. He believed about the Negro race what an American patriot of his day would have believed about America, except that it needed a single country, a nation state, to gather its people in. So he believed in a Negro national character, a Negro national destiny, and he thought it was the duty of black people, especially of the most talented black people, to work together in service of the Negro people. But by the first decades of the 20th century, academic thinking about race was beginning to shift. Mendel's ideas were rediscovered around uh, 1900. 
By 1915, Thomas H. Morgan, who was to receive the first Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1933, had published with his co-authors a book called The Mechanism of Mendelian Heredity, based in large measure on work on the inheritance of mutations in the fruit fly he made famous, Drosophila melanogaster. It's because of Morgan that I spent time in my high school lab playing around with these beastly flies. The astonishing advances in genetics, a term that it was itself coined by William Bateson at Cambridge in about 1905, in the first two decades of the century, forced a general rethinking of the biology of heritable characteristics. Within a generation, there was a synthesis of Mendelian genetics and Darwinian evolutionary theory in the work of the population geneticists led by J.B. Haldane, R.A. Fisher, and Sewell Wright. And this union of Mendelian and Darwinian ideas, one whose broad features remain part of the contemporary scientific picture, this believed by 40% of the American population, received its canonical expression in Sir Julian Huxley's elegant 1942 book, Evolution, the Modern Synthesis. At the same time, changes were occurring in the ways in which people thought about the relationship between biology and culture. In the wake of the new population genetics, one no longer needed to think of the physical appearance and the character of the Negro as the common products of a shared essence. Meanwhile, there were new advances in anthropology, developed, among others, by Franz Boas, who left the Royal Ethnographic Museum in Berlin to move to New York five years before Du Bois arrived at the Friedrich Wilhelm University. Boas's empirical fieldwork undermined many of the claims about race and about cultural development that dominated the writings of earlier geographers and natural historians. Du Bois invited Boas, who was then a professor of anthropology at Columbia, to give a commencement address at Atlanta University when he was a professor there in 1906. Much later, in the book Black Folk Then and Now, published in 1939, Du Bois recorded the impact of Boas's words on his developing ideas. Franz Boas came to Atlanta University, where I was teaching history in 1906, and said to a graduating class, you need not be ashamed of your African past, and then he recounted the history of the black kingdoms south of the Sahara for a thousand years. I was too astonished to speak. All of this I had never heard, and I came then and afterwards to realize how the silence and neglect of science can let truth utterly disappear or even be unconsciously distorted. So Du Bois was clearly aware of the developments in biology and anthropology as they occurred, and he shared his changing understanding with a wider world of black intellectuals in the crisis which he edited for so many years. Some drew the conclusion, and many still do, that at this point there is no longer any reason to take racial grouping seriously. If the properties that members of a race share, or share are only the superficial phenotypic ones that we use in social life to assign people to these categories, they have only superficial things in common. But Du Bois never drew that conclusion. Although he understood that the Western race concept could not be elucidated in purely biological terms, he believed that there was something important that members of a race did share, and that something was important enough to make being a Negro central to his own self-understanding. What could that something be? The answer was, he said, as we saw, closely defined, clearly defined to the eye of the historian and sociologist. Du Bois's development of what we would now call a social constructionist account of race started early. Already in the essay of 1897, which I've already quoted, The Conservation of Races, he'd argued that the human sciences, not the natural sciences, would uncover the real meaning of race. Informed by the new biology of the first decades of the 20th century, he came to see that you could define races by genetically transmitted physical characteristics without thinking that the forms of racial difference that really mattered for social life were consequences of an underlying biology. Contemporary readers may find these points obvious. This is a measure of how pervasive the new understanding has become, with its picture of inheritance as particulate and its distinction between biological and cultural transmission. So it's worth underlining that our common sense here is new and that Du Bois was among the first people in the world fully to grasp its significance. We have new language for some of these insights. We speak of race, as I say, as a species of social construction, a species of social identity. And we have insights now that were not fully available to Du Bois. So I'm going to lay out the general outlines of our contemporary understanding before returning to the ways that Du Bois anticipated it. There are four crucial dim critical dimensions of the contemporary philosophical understanding of identity. First, social identities depend for their existence 
none of this is uncontroversial. I'm just giving you the correct account. <laughs> uh, first, social identities depend for their existence on there being labels for them. This is because people respond to others and think of themselves by way of these labels. We think of people as Caucasians or Canadians or Catholics and then respond to them as such. We think of ourselves and Americans and do or abstain from doing things because that is what we think we are. So the first point is metaphysical. Nominalism about social identities is preferable to ontological realism. What holds groups together is often not a shared essence, but the practices that develop around a shared name. So we can say in a slogan that social identities require labels. Social identity labels are often contested at the boundaries is the daughter of an African-American and an Eskimo raised in Alaska really black? Is the son of an African and a native Hawaiian really Hawaiian? We must accept there can be endless argument about such things. The contestability of the boundaries is, I think, the main reason why nominalism seems to be the only view about identities that will do. To say that boundaries are contestable isn't to say that there are no clear cases, of course. If, once the evidence is in, you judge that Barack Hussein Obama isn't a man, or Al Sharpton isn't an African-American, we will have lost our semantic bearings altogether. There can be clear answers to questions about the ascription of concepts with fuzzy edges. This acknowledged contestability built into our use of the terms is suggestively like the essential contestability of many normative concepts, which W.B. Galley pointed to back in the 1950s. And indeed, the second dimension of identity that I want to point to is precisely that there are norms associated with social identities, uh, norms of identification, I'll call them, which specify ways that people of a certain identity ought to behave, and norms of treatment, ways that people of a certain identity ought or ought not to be responded to and acted upon. And my shorthand for this second claim is that identity is normative. The third dimension of identity flows from this second. Because there are norms of identification, identification People who identify through the labels as X act sometimes as Xs, by which I mean that one reason they act as they do is that they are motivated by the thought, I have a reason to do this thing because I am an X. This last point makes explicit the fact that we now see identities as centrally subjective in the sense that their importance derives from the role they play in the thoughts and acts of those who bear them. So identities we now think are nominal normative and subjective, all of these being features, of course, that may explain why we routinely speak of them as socially constructed. That the identities I am talking about are subjective in this way is a key part of the view. We pick out the subjective identities because they have a crucial role in the making of our lives. Notice that this theory brings together points that Du Bois was among the first to make clearly about one social identity, namely Negro. We can begin with Du Bois's recognition that race, as a species of social identity, is made in and through social processes. We can distinguish, as he did, between the outward and visible signs, what he called the badge of hair and color, on the one hand, on the basis of which we assign people to these groups, and the social meaning of their membership. In identifying the key role of the racial label, Du Bois's approach uh, expresses a form of nominalism. We can also see with him that the ethical significance of our identities derives from the way in which they give us projects, from the fact, uh, as he put it in his Negro Creed more than a century ago, that people of a shared identity strive, quote, together for the accomplishment of certain more or less vividly conceived ideals of life. But we can grasp, too, that the meaning of an identity is determined not just by the bearers of the badge, but by the responses of others. That, as he once put it, the black man is a person who must ride Jim Crow in Georgia. And we understand, as Du Bois did, that we can have many identities and that one of them to take up and celebrate is a cosmopolitan identity as human beings, citizens of the world we share. More specifically, when it comes to the Negro identity, Du Bois saw that identity could be grounded not in blood, but in a place and in an identification with its history. Once he understood the Negro socially and historically, the significance of African descent didn't need to lie in the genes that African Americans brought from Africa. It could lie in cultural traditions or the continuing significance of a black identity in the present. Because black people share a black identity, and that identity is narratively rooted in Africa, 
What happens in and to Africa affects black people everywhere through their own identifications as well as through the views of others. And here Du Bois anticipates another modern insight about social identity, which is how central narrative is to it. It's as the bearer of a Negro identity, not as the bearer of Egyptian genes, that he can find inspiration in the achievements of pharaonic Egypt. And one aspect of Du Bois's commitment as a Negro was his engaging with the history of Africa, not just with what happened in Africa in the past, but with narrations of an African past. He wrote many African histories. Just as American patriots live their identity through stories of America, stories rooted somewhat loosely sometimes in the soil of historical fact, so a black identity engages you with tales of an African past. Told right, of course, such stories bind people together so that they can accomplish shared goals. This point, it is Ernest Reynolds' famous insight about the connection between historical narratives and nationalism, is one on which Du Bois relied on the many occasions that he sought to rally black people to the cause of black liberation. But Du Bois's connection to Africa and to a Negro identity was made not just in his formidable brain, but in his pulsing heart. In his 1942 autobiography of a race concept, he writes with all the characteristic feeling, all his characteristic feeling, of his arrival on the African continent for the first time just before Christmas 1923 as the American representative to the inauguration of a new Liberian president. When shall I forget the night I first set foot on African soil? I am the sixth generation in descent from forefathers who left this land. The moon was at the full and the waters of the Atlantic lay like a lake. All the long afternoon, as the sun robed herself in her western scarlet with veils of misty cloud, I had seen Africa afar. Perhaps Du Bois's largest achievement is to have found a way to express his theoretical insights in language that makes his ideas both memorable and uplifting, addressing mind and heart together. And I want to remind you in closing of one of these passages, one that is relatively well known. It is, it's once more from Dusk of Dawn, that autobiography, in fact, just a page earlier than his rapturous effusions about those first African steps. For in this passage, written in his 70s, Du Bois encapsulates most of his theory of a black identity in his own inimitable style. Here, explicitly in the context of his own life story, he set out to answer County Cullen's famous question, what is Africa to me? Once I should have answered the question simply, I should have said fatherland, or perhaps better motherland, because I was born in the century when the walls of race were clear and straight, when the world consisted of mutually exclusive races, and even though the edges might be blurred, there was no question of exact definition and understanding of the meaning of the word. But one thing is sure, and that is the fact that since the 15th century, these ancestors of mine and their descendants have had a common history, have suffered a common disaster, and have one long memory. The actual ties of heritage between the individuals of this group vary with the ancestors that they have in common with many others. But the physical bond is least, and the badge of color, relatively unimportant save as a badge. The real essence of this kinship is its social heritage of slavery, the discrimination and insult, and this heritage binds together not simply the children of Africa, but extends through yellow Asia and into the South Seas. It is this unity that draws me to Africa. However much there is to contend with in this passage, it is both densely argued and deeply moving. Dusk of dawn, he, he knew, uh, deeply moving. He knew that he lived in the dusk of understanding. In his more optimistic moments, he believed that the dawn would follow, and he may even have sensed that his own work might speed its arrival. It's an old African trick, making the sun move faster. If Du Bois' work still manages to cast not a shadow but a glow, it's fueled by a rooted cosmopolitanism that enriches the drone of universality with the lively humanism of conversation, that complicates the tempting reduction of race, reductionism of race, and that draws from a history of suffering a buoyant sense of purpose and of hope. As Skip Gates' career shows us, that buoyancy can be contagious. I'm grateful to the man we celebrate today for turning my attention towards such work and to the larger project it advances. In this, as in many things, I'm following not just Skip's example, but his inspiration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Appiah.
Never has illuminating Du Bois been so rapturously illuminated. Thank you very, very much. We're going to conclude our program with some words from Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Professor Gates is the rare uh, professor known by face and name because the work he has done has genuine reach in the wonderful way that Professor Appiah just explained for us, the way in which the study of the particular takes us all over the planet. He made his name with the brilliant signifying monkey, which he spoke with us about earlier today. Again, thinking about what an organic, uh, what a ground up African American theory of literature would look like. And who can forget the impact of that book and how it changed black studies and how it changed literary studies. He helped to build African American studies here, as I have said, and he truly ground up built African American studies at Harvard into the mighty brother to us that it is today. Uh, and I want to say how happy I am uh, that our, our friends and dear colleagues from Harvard have come uh, for this wonderful day, Professors William Julius Wilson, Marcelina Morgan, Larry Bobo, and my own dear dissertation advisor, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. So we're very, very glad that you've come for this wonderful, wonderful day with us. Um, any uh, uh, proper introduction of Professor Gates must be condensed, and I want to hear what he has to say, too. Uh, but uh, to say a few things, he is the Alphonse Fletcher University professor at ha Harvard University, as well as director of the Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research. His books and his documentaries uh, go on and on and on. Most recently, you've no doubt seen Blacks in Latin America, which came out from New York University Press and was a PBS series. Faces of America, uh, one of his most recent PBS documentaries. Tradition and the Black Atlantic Criticism and Black At of and the Black Atlantic Criticism in the African Diaspora. These are just a few recent books. Co-editor of Call and Response, Key Debates in African American Studies that many of us teach with. It is the most wonderful book to teach almost any African American Studies class with. He is editor-in-chief of The Root, a daily online magazine focusing on is issues of interest to the black community written from an African American perspective. Uh, he has, the, the books go on and on and on and on and really, um, uh, I, I want, I want to hear him talk rather than list all of them, but I want to just note a few loose cannons, notes on the culture war, colored people, a, a memoir, the future of the race co-authored with Cornell West, 13 ways of looking at a black man, which is one of my personal favorites, uh, in search of our roots, how 19 extraordinary African Americans reclaimed their past, on and on. He earned his master's and PhD in English literature from Clare College at the University of Cambridge, and uh, more importantly, received his BA in English literature summa cum laude from Yale University in 1973, uh, and has taught at Yale, Cornell, and Duke universities. He has received, uh, I, I'm sure the, this is an old number, and it's probably like a month old, 51 honorary degrees, <laughs> uh, as well as a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant uh, and uh, more awards than we could mention. We miss Professor Gates still at Yale, but we feel ourselves again in conversation with our friends at Harvard. And we also uh, know that in his generosity, we are in an intellectual community that strives to understand, because of his example, more deeply the history, culture, social movements, and philosophical thought of black people all over the globe. Before I invite him to the stage, I also have to say that once your teacher, always your teacher. So I'm especially happy to be introducing someone I met 30 years ago on this campus in the seminar, Black Women and Their Fictions my world was changed evermore. Skip Gates was the teacher who brought me into the work I do, who called me in, the teacher who showed me how it could be done, the teacher whose own committed and prodigious work is ever animated by a true, deep, and abiding love for the creative beauty, brilliance, foibles, and all else of black people. When you make a friendship that begins that way, that begins with a shared love of precious books, and in the case of African American literature, of words once neglected or lost to time, those connections are indelible, rare, and beautiful. <laughs> 
So uh, with all my heart and love, I want to welcome, and I'll ask you to join me, the man whose work we honor today with this lecture, the man who we love and who we welcome back to Yale, Skip Gates. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for, for this day. And I want to thank President Levin and the faculty of the Department of African American Studies for making this day possible. It's difficult to, for me to think of a greater honor in the life of a Yale alumnus than to have one's alma mater create a lecture in one's name. And it's been launched with such eloquence and grace by Kwame Anthony Apia. I'm deeply appreciative and honored, Anthony, that you accepted the faculty's invitation to do so. Anthony and I met 39 years ago this month at Clare College at the University of Cambridge. And his friendship has been sustaining and his formidable intellect inspiring since that time. I can't think of a more perfect person to launch this series. Please give it up for Anthony. <laughs> I'm also so deeply grateful um, to my colleagues at Harvard for coming down today, and my two daughters who are here, my um, daughter Elizabeth, my daughter Maggie. My daughter Maggie was married on Saturday. How about that? So could you give it up for my bride and the groom? <laughs> First, a word about the man whose idea this lecture series was. On the occasion of my 60th birthday, I get a phone call out of the blue from Dan Rose saying that he and Joanna had a surprise. They had decided to endow a lectureship in African American studies and wanted to do so in my name and to do so at Yale, which is Dan's alma mater as well. Now I was stunned by their generosity of spirit. And after protesting that I was not worthy of such an honor myself and even suggesting other names that I felt more appropriate um, for the name of this lecture, including Dan and Joanna's, Dan responded that he and Joanna had made their decision there was nothing I can do about it. Now, there's a tradition in rabbinic Judaism that holds that there are 36 humble, righteous ones who keep the world intact. Without these zadokim, as they are called, the world itself would fray and disappear. Their identities are hidden, the Talmudists say, but I think that we all know the identity of one, because Dan Rhodes is just such a Zadik. This is someone with an amazing mind and an equally amazing heart. His love of argument, his keenness of intellect, his compassion, his sense of justice, these are the compass points of his life, and they inspire everyone who knows him. I know that they humble and inspire me. And of course, there's only one person whose force of mind and character can humble and inspire Dan Rose, and that's his wife, Joanna Rose. <laughs> Knowing these two has been one of the great privileges of my life. When I think about all that Dan and Joanna have accomplished with their philanthropy for people of color and for the poor, I inevitably think of the great W.E.B. Du Bois, who famously wrote in The Souls that, quote, we must not seek to make men carpenters, but to make carpenters men. And no single quote more fully embodies the spirit in which the roses give than this one. As I sat in the audience two Saturdays ago to witness the induction of Dan and Joanna into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, I couldn't help but think of how diligently Dan has worked for so many years to ensure that young men and women of color, children born into circumstances less than ideal, less than fair, would one day find their name tag at the high table of world culture. Frederick Douglass once said that the slave yearned, above all else, for, quote, a future with hope in it, unquote. Dan Rose, through a project he created called the Harlem Educational Activity Fund, has given over 1,000 poor brown and black children, the least fortunate among us, that future with hope in it, including some who have even been educated here at Yale. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for my friend, Dan Rose. 
Dan and Joanna took the, this crazy idea of theirs <laughs> to Rick Levin, who in turn took it to dear Elizabeth. What could one say about Rick other than the fact that when the history of this era in the long life of Yale is written, no one will be recalled as a greater president with a deeper commitment both to cultural diversity and to the field of African American studies than he. This is someone who, has, who always believed that fields like African and African American studies should be at the heart of a great liberal arts education and not peripheral to it. As an academic and an institution builder, Rick wears the mantle of leadership with so much grace and seeming effortlessness. And Rick and the university have been blessed to have Elizabeth Alexander at the helm of the department. Elizabeth and I have been on a long journey together. As she just said, we met here in a course I taught called Black Women and Their Fictions exactly 30 years ago this past September. So this is a sort of special anniversary for us. And she has since become a dear, dear friend. I've read and taught her fierce and beautiful poetry and criticism. I have cheered from the sidelines as she has won prize after prize in recognition of her contributions to contemporary poetry. And with the rest of the nation and the world, I watched with pride as she delivered her poem, Praise Song for the Day, at Barack Obama's inauguration in 2009. Not only American poetry, but African American studies are both much richer for her being in them. Thank you, dear Fred, for all that you have done for our field, for this great university, and for me. With your indulgence, I'd like to spend just a few minutes paying homage to my mentors in African American studies, to the people who brought me to the proverbial table. Now, my route to this day really began on Wall Street, not the Wall Street in Manhattan, but the much more famous Wall Street in New Haven, <laughs> first at the Yale Law School and then at one of the community's best known eating establishments. Now, who could have imagined that the rebirth of black studies would happen in a pizza shop in New Haven, Connecticut. Who would have thought that a pizza shop should become a stop on New Haven's Black History Trail? And not one of New Haven's great pizza shops either, <laughs> like Pepe's or Sally's, but Naples Pizza. Naples has been remembered for generations of Yaleys uh, for the astonishing capacity of its slices to soak up inordinate amounts of alcohol consumed by undergraduates late of a Saturday night. But it was also the site from the mid-70s until the mid-80s for one of the greatest seminars in the history of Afro-American studies, as we called it then. Seminar, a veritable salon, really, held each morning over breakfast and often resuming over lunch, six days a week at the same square table in the restaurant's middle dining room and presided over by a young, recently tenured historian of slavery and the South, a professor named John Wesley Blassingame Sr. Now, no one knows what special charms that Naples held for John Blassingame. All we know is that in Naples, John had found his perch, his office away from his office, and there he held court virtually all day long. If you wanted to have a meeting with John, if you wanted to talk about a paper you were writing, for one of his classes, if you wanted advice about a research project, if you wanted to discuss a pay raise or your prospects for tenure, it was at Naples, at John's table, that these discussions would be held, surrounded by those classic American diner, white and green rimmed porcelain coffee cups, ashtrays filled with the remnants of pack after pack of Winston's that John smoked one after the other from dawn to dusk all the day long. Blast as we called him affectionately, had come to campus during my junior year with great anticipation since he was the first black scholar to teach African American history at Yale. I had come to Yale in September 1969, one of 96 black men and women who were the first fruits of Yale's adventure in affirmative action. As an undergraduate, I was most interested in American political history under the mentorship of the great John Morton Blum who directed my Scholar of the House project with tender, loving care. 
It was Mr. Blum who first told me that I could become a scholar and or a journalist, and I owe more to him than I could ever adequately express here. But just like everybody black at Yale in 1969, I enrolled in the history department's introduction to Afri Afro-American history course taught by William S. McFeely, who counted among his teaching assistants a Yale graduate student named Thomas Holt. Is Bill McFeely in the room? Oh, he wasn't able to come. Oh, too bad. It was a legendary course unfolding week to week in the increasingly volatile atmosphere of escalating protests against the Vietnam War and the simultaneous escalation of the persecution of the Black Panther Party, as well as the trial of Black Panther leader Bobby Seale taking place right here in New Haven. In a word, the atmosphere in New Haven and on campus was extraordinarily volatile. Each class an adventure as we waited for the revolution to come. Nobody missed the class, first because of the quality of Professor McFeely's lectures, and second because the Panthers were just as likely to show up on any given day, demand equal time to espouse their 10-point program, and then attempt to intimidate us into giving donations, supposedly for their free breakfast program. <laughs> <laughs> Professor McFeely's lectures were vignettes of the black past, which had an uncanny way of serving as allegories for what the black community was experiencing today. I well remember his end of the second reconstruction um, his end of the second Reconstruction Lecture, delivered just after Richard Nixon on January 19, 1970, nominated the conservative judge, G. Harold Carswell, to replace Abe Fortas on the court. The room was packed. You could have heard a pin drop. Threatening clouds were on the horizon, Professor McFeely warned. And unless we were vigilant, the very policies that had brought all of us black kids to Yale were going to be reversed by a conservative Supreme Court. It was history teaching designed as extended metaphor for those who would soon be history making themselves. Bill McFeely, who would go on to win a Pulitzer Prize in history for his magisterial biography of U.S. Grant, was our guide into the wonders of African American history. Bill McFeely also taught me something else, ladies and gentlemen, and that is that you don't have to look like an academic subject to be an expert in that subject. And despite the fact that the more militant among us had a most annoying habit of standing up during question period following his lectures to ask him what he, a white man, was doing teaching a black history course, he never once lost his patience or his composure, never once admonished the students for their rudeness. And he did all that he could do to ensure that John Blassingame was hired to replace him as head of that class. He's not here. Uh, I think he was too feeble to come down. Elizabeth graciously uh, offered to send a car for him. But in his absence, please give it up for my mentor, William McKee. <laughs> Blass, for his part, thought that lecture courses were most certainly not the most effective way to teach. And he did all that he could do to discourage students from attending his lectures. <laughs> Within the two weeks or so of, of uh, shopping period, uh, his first year at the helm, John succeeded in turning Bill McFeely's popular lecture course with over 200 students into a teeny tiny seminar. The truth is, John wasn't much of a lecturer. But in private and small groups, he was hilariously funny, a great raconteur with an astonishing encyclopedic grasp of the minutia of black history. I ran into John a few times as an undergraduate, but the most memorable time was on the steps in front of Sterling. We had never met or been formally introduced. I just happened to be the person his eyes met as he glanced up from something that he was reading. He was smoking a Winston and holding a picture, an image now quite famous of a slave whose back was covered with deep, deep keloid welts running the length of his torso from waist to neck like a river delta. And John had tears in his eyes. Can you believe that a human being could do this to another human being, he asked me. I didn't even know what to say. But I never forgot that image, and I, I never forgot the pain look on his face. I would recall that encounter when I walked into Naples on my first day of work as Secretary B in the program of Afro-American Studies, the first thing in the morning, on the first Monday in October 
1975, bearing a message from Charles T. Davis, our chair, to his errant knight, John Blassingate. Blass read it and invited me to sit down, turning his face to avoid blowing smoke into mine. And in a sense, I never got up from that chair. As for the man who had sent me there, Charles Davis, he had come to campus as the first tenured African American in the English department and soon became the first black master of Calhoun College. I was actually a junior at Yale when I met Charles Davis. My girlfriend, big junior year item, Linda Darling, now the well-known Linda Darling Hammond, Linda Darling and I had persuaded <laughs> Mr. Davis to supervise a directed reading course on the history of black popular culture, second, se uh, second semester of that year. We were an item, as they say, and madly in love, foolishly in love, we had decided to take several classes together during that second semester. The only problem was, ladies and gentlemen, that come mid-February, we broke up. <laughs> so we decided to divide up the courses <laughs> that we share <laughs> and share each other's notes to avoid each other's most unpleasant company. <laughs> she drew Mr. Davis's tutorial. We wrote the paper together for the final grade, but she covered the tutorial meetings. I was too embarrassed ever to try to explain to Charles Davis why. Uh, it never occurred to me that I would one day be at his mercy. After a couple weeks at the Yale Law School, I realized that what I'd really wanted to do was to complete my PhD dissertation in English, which I had begun at Cambridge, and teach African and African American literature. And so, out of sheer desperation, I went to see Charles Davis over at Calhoun to see if he could give me some advice about a job, meaning find me a job. <laughs> After reminding me that my attendance in our tutorial three years before <laughs> had been rather spotty, <laughs> he sized up the situation quickly and ascertained that I did have, in the end, one special talent. I was a fast typist. <laughs> and just by luck, the program had a vacancy, and he hired me on the spot. I walked back up Wall Street, and I took a leave of absence from the, from the law school. And the last time I checked, ladies and gentlemen, I was still on leave. <laughs> and for the next nine months, I found myself typing much of the correspondence and manuscripts for the faculty of Yale's Afro-American Studies program before Mr. Davis managed to get me promoted to a lectureship in English and Afro-Am. Not bad for a secretary. And that's how I ended up delivering Davis's message to Blassingame that first day of work on that first Monday in October. Truth be told, Charles and John weren't especially fond of each other. After all, they were a study in contrasts. Consider, John was tall, Charlie was short. John was descended from southern slaves, most definitely field. Charlie from a long line of well-educated northern teachers, preachers, and professionals, probably descended, as he liked to claim, from slaves who had served in the big house. John was dark complexioned, Charlie light complexioned. Charlie thought that John was brash, country, uncouth. John, for his part, thought that Charlie put on airs and was bougie and sedity with it. <laughs> John was always an administrator in a hurry. Charlie, on the other hand, saw the history of academic disciplines in decades, not in months or in memos. <laughs> and he thought the confrontation was the last resort of the weak and the unimaginative. Charlie's weapons of choice were a martini, a mint julep, a Smithfield ham, and piping hot biscuits. Charlie thought the president and provost were the local embodiment of Western civilization and that his job as a leader of the academic vanguard of the race was to show them both that the Negro knew which fork to use at a dinner party on Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> John thought that the provost's office was a treasury to be plundered, <laughs> to create incremental professorships, a graduate program, and research support for his faculty. Charlie lived much of the spring in anticipation of the Kentucky Derby, which he thought of as the two most exciting, as the most exciting two minutes in all of sports as he was fond of repeating, especially as April melted into May. 
Charlie owned a beautiful white linen suit and white bucks, which he wore only one day a year, and that was on the day of the Kentucky Derby. He would assemble certain members of the faculty and friends for a cocktail party, never John Blaskin, and ply them with mint juleps and that Smithfield ham and those biscuits in anticipation of the starting bell. Rarely have I seen an adult derive more pleasure from a single sporting event. John, for his part, thought that the Kentucky Derby was a holdover from slavery and best should be boycotted. For all their differences of temperament, experience, and background, they knew deep down that they needed each other. They realized that there was not one way to be a scholar of Afro-American studies, and they knew that each had weaknesses and blind spots for which only the other could compensate. Through it all, nonetheless, they maintained a certain grudging respect for each other, and perhaps even a certain peculiar sort of affection. And it is from their widely varying approaches and personalities that we modeled our own plan for action when Anthony and I went up to Harvard. To take a leadership role in our field with the considerable help and support of many of my colleagues in this room. In fact, virtually every departure we attempted over the last two decades emerged either from a certain seminar presided over at Naples Pizza Shop by one John W. Blassingame or that other seminar presided over by Charles Davis in the master's living room at Calhoun College. If there's anyone who deserves to be honored for reinventing the field of African American studies in the 70s and 80s, a fashioning it into a form that would flourish into the 21st century, it is Charles T. Davis and John W. Blessingham Sr. And I'm so happy that the very best of what they represent is alive and well right here in New Haven, Connecticut, under the leadership of Elizabeth Alexander and the brilliant colleagues in your department. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, my friends, for conferring this great honor upon me. <laughs>